William Wilshire, uh, who was commander of the Native Police Corps in Central Australia through the 1880s, and just read you some extracts from it, just to give you a taste of the story, which is quite a uh, quite a melodramatic story, but in an, in another sense, quite an um, emblematic story that gives us a lot of insight into the culture of violence on Australia's frontiers more broadly, who is one of the more notorious characters in Australian colonial history as um, one of the very limited number of police officers who was charged with the murder of Aboriginal people. But in some ways, William Wilshire is one of those characters who, once he enters into your brain, you never forget him. One of the things that we work over in our book is um, the degree to which William Wilshire was an aberrant figure of the Australian frontier as someone who is now notorious for violence against Aboriginal people under the rubric of colonial law because he was a, um, a mounted police constable and commander of the Native Police Corps to which, to the degree to which he was aberrant and that he was just a, a, a peculiar personality and the degree to which he was in fact representative of a, um, of a much more systematic process of subjugating Aboriginal peoples and therefore not particularly aberrant at all. I'll try and give you a, a little bit of a taste of that story. So first, I'll just give you some extracts. What we do in the first part of the book is just try and set the scene of the state of Central Australia just after the um, laying down of the Overland Telegraph Line in the early 1870s. As I'm sure you know, John McDowell Stewart had uh, only just recently uh, explored the length of the continent from south to north. The Overland Telegraph Line had just gone down and the centre was just starting to open up to pastoral settlement using the Overland Telegraph Line as a departure point. And into this rather sparse and elemental scene where colonial presence is still very in the making, an event took place in 1874 which was a character attack on the Barry Creek Telegraph Line. So this is how we start off. Several years before William Wilshire's arrival in Central Australia, in February 1874, seven white men and an Aboriginal employee outside of his own country sat talking in the dusk outside of the northern wall of the Barrow Creek Telegraph Station. The Overland Telegraph Line had only recently been completed and it now linked the entire continent from south to north. It was a tool of empire that in the coming decade would provide a nodal point for pastoral and mining expansion and mark the beginning of permanent European settlement. But at this stage, Barrow Creek was one of only four isolated stations in the centre, and the other telegraph stations were Alice Springs, Charlotte Waters and Tennant Creek, that monitored the Overland Telegraph Line and provided a departure point for exploration. As the dusk settled on this evening, a large party of Kadacha men approaching from the gully to the south attacked the station. In the first volley of spears, the station master, James Stapleton, was struck in the chest. The eight Barrow Creek men rushed towards the building's only entrance around the corner on the eastern side. But finding the gate blocked by the attackers, they circled the building and with nowhere to go, they made another dash for the entrance. Linesman John Frank was struck by a spear before he reached it and died instantly. Three others, including Stapleton and the Aboriginal employee Jemmy, had been wounded, but seven had reached the safety of the station building and their Snyder, Snyder rifles. Through the loopholes built into the fortified structure, they managed to shoot dead at least two Kadacha men. Outside, the attacking party retreated but didn't leave. Overhead, the line remained intact. The men used it to wire to Adelaide with news of the attack. The closest reinforcements were a travelling line repair party, which was 130 kilometres and two days' journey away. The Adelaide Telegraph headquarters buzzed with the need to organise reinforcements for Barrow Creek and the Commissioner of Police wired the besieged station to tell the men to save their ammunition by only firing with effect. Meanwhile, the station master, James Stapleton, lay mortally wounded. Before he died, he wired a message to his wife, who had been brought to the Adelaide Telegraph station to receive it, and that his, um, the message was uh, transmitted by young Francis Gillen, who later has a major role in um, Wilshire's story. Stapleton's last message is to, said to have read, God bless you and the children. The other wounded man, Ernest Flint, would recover through the line a doctor in Adelaide was consulted each hour or so on the treatment of his injury. The fate of the injured and Aboriginal station hand, Jimmy, was not recorded. Four days later, and after another attack from the Kadacha party outside, the line repair party arrived as reinforcement and relief. The police subsequently then organised 
a series of punitive expeditions uh, against the Kadija people under the command of Maori Constable Samuel Gayson. And the result of those four expeditions documented the deaths of 11 Aboriginal suspects, although other records suggest that the number of Aboriginal lives taken in reprisal for the attack was between 50 and 90, possibly higher. This was the first major clash between Aboriginal people and Europeans in the Territory. This event is just one of many from the colonial period, which would come to feed Australia's burgeoning pioneer mythology of hardships endured and overcome in the winning of the country and of harsh reprisals against treacherous blacks. But the episode resonates with some fascinating contradictions. An, isola an isolated telegraph station is attacked. Inside this small fortress, several whites and one Aboriginal employee are vulnerable in a vast and largely uncolonised territory. But the telegraph line provides them with the colonial infrastructure in various ways. The dying man speaks to his wife via the wire. The injured man receives regular medical advice from a metropolitan doctor, you know, hundreds of miles away. And a telegraph party 130 miles north learns of the attack from an operator in Adelaide and provides reinforcement. So the line brought the entire interior of the continent under the control of the colonial administration in Adelaide and open to imperial gaze. But at the same time, Central Australia was in this historical moment a space on the threshold of a radical change which had not quite arrived. From this moment onwards, pastoral expansion really burgeoned in the centre and the telegraph line stations provided the point where that would be possible. From those first days, pastoralists who were fairly scattered were lobbying for the formation of a native police force because of Aboriginal attacks on their stock. Even though the native police corps in Queensland had already caused a lot of administrative anxiety and was already notorious for dispersing Aboriginal people, the South Australian government responded to the pastoral lobby by establishing a native police force on the understanding that it would be there to protect Aboriginal people as much as pastoralists. And William Wilshire, who had been working uh, as a police officer sent, um, based in Alice Springs for the last couple of years, uh, was appointed as the, um, as the officer in charge. As it transpired, the role of the Native Police Corps in protecting Aboriginal rights as much as pastoralist interests was not met and what we see emerging through the 1980s was a culture of police surveillance and intimidation over Aboriginal people. So I'll just read you an extract on the nature of the rule of law as it pertained in the centre and the culture of terror. Aboriginal people were British subjects and had been since the proclamation of the colony in 1836. So were in theory protect, uh, equally protected by the law as all other British subjects. This was the official rhetoric. When the native police force was established, Wilshire's superior, Sub-Inspector Besley, made the observation that this patrol will have the effect, I'm sure, of keeping the Europeans as well as the blacks in check. Wilshire and his fellow mounted constable, Erwin Wormbrand, certainly understood this rhetoric, but they also understood the reality that their role was to protect the pastoralists by pacifying the Aboriginal people whose lands were being usurped and who were threatening the economic interests of the pastoralists. As Wilshire put it quite plainly, his duty was to see that the wild natives do not interfere with the white settlers. To achieve this end, they knew that they needed and were expected to go beyond the rule of law. Their reports were usually scripted to indicate that due process was being observed. The intention of a patrolling raid is to identify and arrest suspects. Identified suspects are duly called upon to surrender. Handcuffs are at the ready. If the suspects are shot, it is described as a last resource of self-defence. But despite this almost formulaic acknowledgement of judicious, judicial process in their reports, these same reports nonetheless reveal the implicit purpose of patrols. If their task had been simply policing, they would have arrested suspects, yet they rarely report doing so. The police were also required to gain warrants from justices of the peace before they went after Aboriginal cattle killers, but uh, Wilshire, in fact, never did so. He never uh, asked for a warrant. On two of the rare occasions when suspects were arrested by Wilshire, they were later shot while reportedly trying to escape. 
arrests entailed a long and tedious journey south to the local court at Port Augusta. One of the very few times Wilshire and Wembrandt undertook this journey happened to coincide with the publication of Wilshire's first book, a book he had arranged to have printed at Port Augusta. Wilshire and Wembrandt understood that their primary task was not to arrest offenders but to subdue Aboriginal resistance to pastoral occupation. The small community they served most directly, the pastoralists, also understood this. In 1890, Robert Warburton, who was manager of El Thunder Station in the centre, wrote a letter to the minister controlling the territory defending the actions of the police. After reflecting on the violence of earlier Australian frontiers, he indicated that what was happening at this time in the centre was an inevitable phase of frontier settlement. He wrote, of course things are difficult and will be until the blacks knuckle under, but not before. When you have subdued them, you can be as kind as you like to them. It's only the same old story of pioneer settlement over and over again ever since Australia was first settled. But covert violence was a characteristic of the Australian frontier. Often we get hints of it in coded euphemisms. Sometimes we get evidence of it in private accounts made public by the passage of time. But all too often we're left with no choice but to speculate. Contemporary official records, writes the Northern Territory historian Dick Kimber, report the killings of about 44 Aboriginal people in the centre by Europeans between 1860 and 1895. But his analysis of a broader range of evidence suggests a figure closer to 650. Whatever the exact number of fatalities during this period, there is little doubt that it far exceeds the official record. Oh, no, I'm not um, um, the one occasion when, or one of the, the only two occasions in his career when Wilshire actually escorted uh, prisoners to Port Augusta, which he was, of course, supposed to routinely do, um, and it was on the occasion when he was checking up on the printing of his first book. From the mid-1880s, the missionaries at the Lutheran uh, Hermansburg Mission had been complaining about the activities of the police uh, in the region around Alice Springs. The Lutheran mission was only about 100 kilometres away from Alice Springs and many of uh, the people who were running away from the police ended up at their camp uh, at the mission. They were constantly writing to the government in the late 1880s saying, you know, we, the police are supposed to be here to stop the settlers from shooting Aborigines, but who's to stop the police from shooting them? In 1889, they called a public meeting in Adelaide to raise these concerns about the police. They accused Wilshire in particular and the police in general of using excessive violence against Aboriginal people and they had other complaints about police immorality in um, having Aboriginal women living at the police camps. From his, his police camp in the centre, Wilshire wrote back with a barrage of counter-attacks saying that the Hermansburg missionaries were harping old cants who themselves were cruel to Aboriginal people and that the police were there to protect Aboriginal people from the missionaries. And this went on as a kind of um, public war of relations. You see the, the missionaries and the police coming to 50 cuffs swallow. Um, emaciated Aboriginal man sits on the sidelines. But the government decided to uh, hold a commission of inquiry into the activities of the police in 1890 and sent two commissioners to investigate these charges against the police. But in fact, rather than being an expose of police activity, the commission unexpectedly turned into an expose of the Hermannberg mission. The commissioners interviewed some of the missionaries at Hermansburg, but they also spent a lot of time interviewing the police and, most importantly, the pastoralists who supported the police. So it's not surprising that the commission came out this way. When the commissioners handed down their report, none of the charges against the police or the squatters were found to be proven. The evidence of several German missionaries, who probably spoke Aranda better than English, had been pitched against that of the entire pastoral and mining communities of the centre, which had stepped forth in support of the police in general, and of Wilshire in particular, as the front line of protection against troublesome Aborigines. The charges found to be proven were those instead against the missionaries. It had been established, the commissioners reported, that chains had been used to detain Aboriginal people on the mission station and that thrashing was resorted to as a regular punishment. These actions, they wrote, while showing a lack of judgment, were excused on the grounds that they were prompted by the kindest motives. 
In summing up, the Commission has reported that the missionaries had made their statements against settlers and police without careful consideration by acting on the unreliable testimony of the Aborigines. Wilshire's conduct, according to most witnesses interviewed, was praiseworthy. He had done his work well and given satisfaction to the majority of the public. So Wilshire could understandably feel that, you know, criticisms against him had passed with the handing down of the Commissioner's report. And he continued to um, patrol the pastoral stations, send regularly back his reports to Sub-Inspector Besley. And it is interesting that the degree to which uh, lethal force was used was not surreptitiously noted in the police reports. It was quite visible. So if you go back over Wilshire's reports, he routinely reports um, uh, the death of Aboriginal people who were shot while resisting arrest or escaping arrest or showing resistance and interfering with the line of police duty. So it's not that um, the reports fail to demonstrate the use of firearms against Aboriginal people. It's a regular part of police reportage. What's interesting is that these reports are filed away in the ultimately the police commissioner's correspondence files with no actions taken. But by the turn uh, of the decade into the 1890s, the culture of the centre was changing. Increasingly, Aboriginal people were becoming indispensable to the pastoral industry, and the same, very same pastoralists who had lobbied, you know, a number of years before for the establishment of the native police force to subdue uh, Aboriginal presence were now employing Aboriginal people on their stations. There was an increasing administrative quality of surveillance in the centre and the kind of policing practices that Wilshire had been enabled to conduct over the last seven years or so were no longer appropriate. In early uh, 1891, uh, Wilshire and some of his native constables rode at dawn into the Tempe Down station and shot dead two Aboriginal men who were sleeping there. They were shot, one while, was shot while he was asleep and the other was shot in the back while he was trying to run away. Wilshire had undoubtedly wanted to get these men not only because he knew of them as cattle stealers but also because this man had, as part of traditional payback, killed the father of one of the native constables as part of another story of, uh, in Aboriginal law. This, this act of going into Tempe Down Station and shooting dead two men might well have passed without notice, even just uh, a year before. But uh, not long after the Commission of Inquiry and with the changing culture of the centre, it was not something that could pass. Francis Gillen was asked to conduct a Commission of Inquiry into, this, into these deaths, and he found evidence that Wilshire should be committed for, um, or put on a murder charge, charged with murder. So in 1891, Wilshire was brought down to Port Augusta where he went through a murder trial. And almost inevitably, he was found not guilty. The murder trial is, is quite an interesting piece of legal history in South Australia. The native constables had first said that they the usual thing, which is that these two men had had been shot while they were showing violent resistance to arrest, that there were warrants for their arrest and that they were shot in self-defence. But before long, Francis Gillen started picking holes in this. One of the native constables stepped forward and said, well, actually, that's the story because that's what Wilshire told us to say. In actual fact, uh, we went out there to shoot those men. We knew that we were going to shoot them. We didn't have a warrant. We didn't need handcuffs. And we just did what Wilshire told us. At the trial, when this, when this was all coming out, it was construed that the Aboriginal constables were at fault because they clearly didn't know their stories. So they were cast very much as unreliable witnesses who might tell one, one story in one moment and then another story in another. So um, when Wilshire was acquitted, it was to ge the general applause of everyone in the pastoral community. After the trial, letters of support flooded in for Wilshire, but the trial also brought forth some dissenting voices. 
One correspondent to the newspaper questioned a trial in which the case for the prosecution was virtually indistinguishable from the case for the defence. The correspondent commented, commented that after the trial, many people from the North, including himself, had expressed their dissatisfaction at the way it was conducted. He said, I was present and never heard a more one-sided affair. Is it credible that Mr Gillen, who was living near the scene of the murders and was acquainted with previous circumstances connected with Wilshire's treatment at the Black, should have committed him for trial without any grounds whatsoever? I was in the North soon after the murders took place and the universally accepted story was that the Black Trackers shot the unfortunate men by Wilshire's orders and finding that the matter had attracted attention, Wilshire instructed these men to make a statement to Mr Gillen, which statement under cross-examination they retracted. But everyone was determined that Wilshire should be acquitted and the speech for the counsel, oh sorry, the speech of the counsel for the prosecution might certainly have been that for the defence. A few days after the trial, an editorial appeared in the Port Augusta dispatch, cautiously examining the terms on which frontier policing in the, in the interior had been allowed to proceed up to this point. This correspondent wrote, The trial of Mounted Constable Wilshire last week points unmistakably to a necessity for some more efficient manner of dealing with crime in the interior than at present in vogue. If no attempt is made to alter the conditions which now obtain, it would seem as though the protection of Aborigines might be regarded as a mere cant term. As the case stands at present, we have a police officer appointed to take charge of a corps of native trackers away in the interior. The former has absolute control. In fact, his rule is despotic. The men whom he governs are armed with the most deadly and destructive firearms and have every means at hand for committing crime secretively in regions far removed from centres of civilization. Let us put the case plainly. Suppose the officer in charge should be tempted in an indiscreet moment to tumble a few native evildoers head over heels, who need be any the wiser? But the judge found that there was not a tattle of evidence to incriminate Wilshire and he was acquitted. The problem thereafter was what to do with him. He'd become, having been a good man for that job, he was now an embarrassment to the force and uh, an inappropriate person to post in a region that now no longer had need for that form of frontier justice. Wilshire himself was very keen to return to the centre and in fact he consistently asked his superior officers to be returned there. But the commissioner of police, now embarrassed by Wilshire, wouldn't risk having him in the increasingly settled districts around Alice Springs. However, he did still consider Wilshire to be a useful man for the further flung frontiers further north in the Northern Territory. So in 1893, the Commissioner of Pol Police wrote to Wilshire's superior officer, there is likely to be a vacancy in the Northern Territory Police. Is Mounted Constable Wilshire willing to go there? From what I've seen of his disinclination to submit to authority and his evil example to his comrades where he is, I feel I cannot do otherwise than bring his conduct under the notice of the Chief Secretary with a view to his leaving the force. But should he decide on transferring to the Territory, I will request Inspector Falsch to give him a station in the bush at the first opportunity that offers. For although a source of trouble in a station down country, I believe he would be a useful man in the interior. I think it's a really interesting telling observation about the, the, the culture of, of official violence. Um, he's clearly unsuitable now in the settled districts, but is the perfect man for the further north, which is in fact where he was sent. He was sent right up to Victoria River, uh, River in, the, in the, um, the further Northern Territory, but he was very unhappy there. Um, he'd spent a number of years sort of making his place in the uh, patrolling region of the centre. He knew the country, he knew the pastoralists, but he was quite at sea uh, at Victoria River Downs. He clearly no longer felt master of his environment. And the reports he sent to his superior officer became increasingly paranoid. It's an example of the report I'm about to read you. And I think it's nice anyway just to see the reports themselves because, you know, there's something much more visceral about seeing the, um, the original writing. He was, he was writing to his superior officer about a problem he was having where two of his native constables had run off with some of the Aboriginal station hands from the Victorian River Down station, and they had guns with them. So that day, he, this is his official report to the inspector. 
So you see how matters are as all sorts of conspiracies are going on. My anxiety at present is very great. Four civilised black boys adrift, all good shots with three rifles and one revol revolver. I do not know what moment the last made to camp in the dark. He had still two native constables with him. There is something hanging in the atmosphere that so far I have failed to discover. Perhaps it, it's an attack on this station or one of the other stations. It's not safe for one to go far away, though I should like to track Jim up and get the rifle and revolver. As for our Jim, his decamped native constable, he is a most deceitful liar with an oily tongue. Whatever may be the ultimate outcome of all this, I cannot say, but I look to you for protection from any lying slander that this oily-tongued absconder may cause. I was always kind but very firm with them, but not long ago discovered that there is no gratitude in them and friendship they are unable to appreciate. The only redeeming feature he, features he possessed was that he was a fairly good shot. To say the least of it, this is a rough place with treachery all around you, and when black boys belonging to the country turn out with firearms, matters are getting tropical. But I promise I will go out tomorrow and look them up, and I promise you I will do my duty to the very last out in the open. I'm not afraid of any black fellow with firearms, but their treachery lurks beneath so many guises, such as long grass, behind rocks, in creeks, and high up in gorges. And this was his official report. After this event, Wilshire was wanting to um, dip out from where he was, so he, he asked for a transfer south, and that's what he got. It, it seems something of an anticlimax after the um, sort of the, the rather melodramatic nature of his career, but uh, after he came south from Victoria River Downs, he was stationed in a number of small rural centres in southern South Australia where he saw out the rest of his career um, as a country copper. And when he retired from the force, he, he joined the abattoirs out at Gawler uh, as a superintendent. So we, we finish off with the irony that Wilshire, who had spent his career pursuing and shooting down uh, Aboriginal cattle killers, uh, ended his career overseeing uh, the killing of cattle in the, in the uh, abattoirs. In our book, we look a little bit at the way that Wilshire has been remembered in Central Australia. In colonial history, he's, he's very much a notorious figure, but he still has a presence in the centre as a reputable figure. As you can see, his, his name is on one of the central streets in Alice Springs, and it's another irony that Wilshire Street uh, is also um, a safety house zone. I think that's all. Thank you. Uh, you've given a wonderful talk, barbarity and horribleness, but um, what about his background? How did he, how, where did he come from? How did he get to be this kind of person? Mm. You know, did he have a terrible, abused childhood or oh, such? No. Do you know anything he like that? He was very much a, a middle class boy. Um, his father was a, a school teacher and he had a middle class upbringing and he he could have gone into any administrative role but he he, he didn't he, he chose to enroll in the police force very early I think he was about 20 and he clearly had a taste for adventure he was he was clamoring to get to the to the frontier fringes but yes there was I mean a lot of the being being a, a, a mounted constable in the 19th century was not an easy job, as I'm sure you would imagine. Um, and often native cunts, um, the, um, the mounted troopers were people who had limited education, limited opportunities elsewhere, but uh, Wilshire was not one of those boys. <laughs> he was, he was a very strange man though. I mean, we were interested in him too because he wrote three, three books which were ostensibly kind of pseudo-ethnographies of that late colonial period, claiming to be uh, about the, the um, laws and customs of Aboriginal people. And in fact, he did produce quite a useful glossary of Aranda language, which I think linguists still use. But th those books are really quite extraordinary. Um, they're very much in the mode of 
adventure romances of that late colonial kind. And they, they're spattered with, spattered? Splattered? Dotted with um, references to Ryder Haggard and Ernest Fabenk and all those um, colonial or imperial adventure romance writers who he obviously loved. And it's just one of those curiosities that he was, he was in the police force and in a place at a time in history where it was possible to actually live out the adventure romance as one would in a novel. Um, a lot of the earlier fr Australian frontiers, of course, were completely uh, receded by the 1870s. So Central Australia was a very late opening frontier in Australian history. It was also the period that adventure romance in fiction was at its height and um, that kind of boy's own adventure was very popular and well, she had the opportunity, as it were, to actually play it out. Um, there's a review this month in the Adelaide Review of a book called The Last Protector, which, as I understand it, Michael Atchison, Atkinson, the Attorney General, tried very hard to prevent its publication and restricted the author's rights, retrospectively even, to access Aboriginal Department files has your work also suffered from Michael Atkinson's um, restrictions? Well, I wouldn't say it had suffered. As, as I said to you, we certainly um, found it at moments... I guess we haven't been working on a project where we've been going back looking in particular for the protector reports, which we, in fact, already had a huge pile of before uh, that ruling came in. But, I mean, I, as I said, I, you, you can still access files but of course you have to you have to know what you're looking for so in research terms it's a delicate issue I think I mean I respect the point that um, even as researchers you can't necessarily go traipsing through files where there might be sensitive issues issues sensitive to Aboriginal people the difficulty of course is that unless you know what files you're looking for you can't ask for them <laughs> which is a problem I guess we have yet to uh, come across Yes, yes, yes. We've kind of moved into... We're working on a project at the moment on um, the rule of law, so we've largely been able to circ circumvent that. You, 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 you say that the, uh, the Aboriginals were, were cattle stealers, but you don't say anything about the, the pastorists stealing their women or using up all their water supplies or any of the... There's always two stories to a... Two sides to a story. Mm, sure, it's not. I don't think it's not that I think that Aboriginal people were cattle killers. No. It's that that's the way the police treated them, of and, course. And I did a bit of research up when it was up at Alice Springs a couple of years ago, and the the troopers had a very hard life. A, a, a trooper told you, I think, was the first trooper a South Australian policeman sent up there, and he was a policeman at Strathalbyn at the time, and he applied. In uh, December 1859, he applied to get married, and the inspector said, "Applications for permission to marry are becoming too numerous in the Mounted Police. Mm. I should be glad if if Tro Trooper Fosky would get the fancy out of his mind and remain in the police as a signal man for a few more years. I should be sorry if he rendered his position in the Mounted Police insecure by marrying, which he would do." as the number of married men is already inconveniently great. Yes. So. We did actually, we tried to, because there were so many uh, references in the, in the police records about the problems of married police, we tried to see if anywhere in the regulations about mounted police, if it was actually stated that they could not be married. And we couldn't find that. So I think, I think it, it probably wasn't official policy that mounted police constables were not allowed to be married but it was certainly the culture and certainly they were discouraged discouraged from marrying mm. there's no question that it was a difficult life mm. Amanda when, when did he retire from the force please yes when was that now that's one of the details that over the course of five years I've forgotten was it 1907 it was quite late I mean, it was into the, it was the early 20th century when uh, he didn't die until, in fact, just before the Coniston massacre, which was 1928. He died in 1925. I think he retired from the force in. That's one of the details. One of the years I've forgotten. However, he did apply in 1907. The protector position came up. And well, she applied for it, 
And he really wanted it. And he said, he wrote a letter saying, you know, I think I'd be the perfect man for this job, knowing the Aborigines as I do, and, <laughs> but, and, and being, being familiar with their ways. But in fact, it didn't go to him. It went to Mounted Constable South, who had been the, the officer who had had to commit him for trial on the murder charge back in 1891. But yeah, it was around about then, it was sort of the first decade of the 20th century when he retired. Uh, sorry, just as another curious thing, because David and I were talking about um, family connections in the German, German uh, community. I only discovered last year, uh, you know, after this book was out, when I was up in Cal, cause, because Wilshire had one of his last postings in Cal in the early years of the 20th century where he kind of did nothing really except, you know, pick up the odd rabid dog. You know, it was very much, you know, a quiet posting. And as it happens, my husband's family comes from Cal and um, we were up there visiting his grandmother, who's 97. And um, uh, somehow we got on to talking about family history because I'd visited the local Cal Historical Museum and saw that there were a lot of Howells, the name Howell in the museum. So I was saying to Sean's grandmother, so there's a lot of Howells, you know, in, in Cal, you know, and as Will Sheehan had married a Cal girl called Ellen Howell. And, uh, and I said that I'd been working on a book where, you know, the subject of our study had married a girl from Cal called Ellen Howell. And my husband's grandmother said, oh yeah, that's my auntie Nell. <laughs> so to my horror, I discovered that I was actually related by marriage to William Wilshire. <laughs> it was quite a shock. I'm winding up the questions here. As, uh, Amanda, apart from being an associate professor, is also a mother, and she has a teenage boy who's wandering around the fringe, who's going to be collected uh, probably when his mother rings on the mobile fairly shortly. Right. <laughs> what have I forgot to say in my introduction uh, in relation to... Amanda and Robert's book In the Name of the Law was that they've also written Fatal Collisions in 2001 and one, which was, uh, I think, awarded a prize that this society sponsored at the History Conference in 2000 and 2001, I guess, was the History Conferences. It would have was in that year, my first year as president. So it's um, entirely fitting that we've, we've had Amanda here this evening with us. Amanda, it always falls to me to get the vote of thanks. <laughs> it's just a dreadful job. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tonight, it's, I, I'm never quite sure what to say, but tonight you have presented to us a very complex man, and I think it's fair to say that your research and the conclusions you've had to draw for him has been a very complex project. So with those few words, but well-meant words, I do thank you very much for sharing the story of William Wilshire, uh, his career, him as a person, uh, his ups and downs, the, the Aboriginal issues associated with it, the, the media circus that probably went with the trial of a policeman. It must have been fascinating research and we appreciate very much you sharing it with us. Thank you.